Okay, so um, regarding the exam, uh, I will, because I, I am the one who going to be grading, so I will take some time. I hope to finish it maybe two weeks from now. Uh, but yeah, just wait a bit. Uh, okay, so this one um, is a new chapter of this course. Um, so to like a advanced graph algorithm, which is a maximum flow. Let me ask you a bit like, have did they cover maximum flow in your previous class at all? Okay, so I will just good good. I will just start from from the beginning. Yeah. So this this maximum flow problem is is basically um, kind of more advanced than just uh, the first search or connectivity, but actually it's, it is really at the central uh, of graph problem. Um, it has been de developing since like 60 years ago, like in the 60s, and until like the last like a uh, few months, still like a lot of interesting thing is still going on just on this problem. So people really look at this problem intensively. Um, so let's see what, what it is. So the problem is like a, it's a graph problem where you are given directed graph, so you have directed edge on, on between each node. And then there's gonna be like a special two nodes, S and T. Uh, you think of this S as a source and T as a sink, and then um, on each edge, think of it as a, a what, like a pipe that you can send water through it. And there's gonna be like a capacity. Okay. Like this, this integer, like positive number on each edge is like a capacity of that pipe. And the goal is kind of intuitively, you kind of want to send a lot of water so the water can enter this network at, at the node S, the source, and you kind of want to send the water to, to T, to the sink. Okay. So water can enter at S and can leave at T. And for every other node, um, you, would, you need to have uh, a flow conservation. That is, the water that go into entering S, uh, entering this node, which is not S and T, must be the, be the same as the water that leaving it. Okay. So, like, it need, like, water needs to go somewhere. It cannot just stop at any node except S and T. Okay. And yeah, and now, this, now the capacity just makes sense because what you want is that the water that goes through each edge here yeah, cannot exceed the capacity. So, and, and the goal is, yeah, you want to maximize the amount of water that you send from S to T. Let me give example. Um, like, so here, I, I just assign the amount of water. Like, think of this as like the rate of how much water goes through this edge. This is like a water goes through this edge by, like, with 20 units. Then, it go to this node. It need to go out somewhere. So this one to go out 20 units as well. So every node here, you see, like, you have flow conservation. Like here, you are, like the flow is given sent from S to this node by 40 units. It need to go out by 40 as well. And like the amount of total water that you have sent from from S to T here. In total, it's like uh, 60, 65, just some. So that's, that's a problem. So let me give like uh, some simple example. Yeah, I was wondering, um, does S need to have like no incoming edges and T need to have no outgoing edges? Uh, not, you don't need that. You don't need that assumption. And, and this, this graph, I, I draw it as a DAG where there is no, no cycle, but you can allow cycle in the graph as well. Okay. And let me give some simple example. 
like if if the graph look like look like this graph, then you see that um, like uh, easily you can easily see that the maximum flow value is is two. Just you can think like you want to send water in this way. Set this to be one one, so it so that it respect the capacity. Here you you set it to be one and one. Right. Um, how about this this graph? Um, how much flow you can send through the the top part? One, right? Because this is the kind of what the bottleneck. You can send this thing, uh, but you get bottleneck here, and and for the lower part, you can send like a two unit of flow. So the, the max flow in this the max flow value in this graph is three. Okay. And uh, so this is like a max flow value. You send one and one, send two and two here. Yeah. How about this graph? Well, uh, you don't need to use this edge, right? You can just send send flow like this. So that's like two. Max flow value is two again. And <clears throat> so I just draw. Good. And this one is an example that of the flow, which is not maximum. It's a valid flow because it respects the capacity. I just send through this thing by one, but it's not maximum because the value is just one here. So this is like uh, just a bunch of example, but let me now tell you in more uh, formal way um, what is ST flow in a more mathematical way. Okay, so you can think of the flow as assignment that like you just assign the value to each pair of nodes. Okay. For each pair of node, you assign some, some number into it. And we're going to say that this flow is feasible if it satisfies the following. The first thing is that uh, for any pairs of node, right, uh, you need to respect the capacity. You cannot, you cannot send flow on that edge, on, on that edge by more than the capacity. And if the capacity, if there is no edge between U and V, the capacity is just zero. You also need to have flow conservation. That is, like, for every node which is not S and T, any node U which is not S and T, I want to have flow in to U equals to flow out to, of U. So flow in of U, which is defined to be like summing over all flow from all node to U. Right? It needs to be equal to flow out of U, which is just the sum over all flow that you send out of it. So that's flow conservation. So that's the sort of thing that I need. Um, by the way, I actually will, I want to, to say another thing, which is like, it's not strictly needed, but it's going to be much better not notationally. Like, it makes the notation much, much nicer, um, which is, I, I, I said that, um, the flow is group, is uh, is skew symmetric. That is, the flow from U to V is like uh, minus the flow from V to U. So thing like if I send the flow from from V from U to V, it's like that is like a minus. Like if there is one unit of flow from U to V, it's like the, there's a minus unit of flow from V to U because the flow has direction. So, for example, if I send flow like this, right, from S to U to V to T, then the flow from U to V here is one, and this respect the capacity because the capacity is one. And with this notation that the flow is skew symmetry, the flow from V to U is minus one. But it also respects the capacity because the capacity from V to U is zero. There's no edge from V to U. Okay. How about an edge from 
above from S to T, there is just no edge here. Yeah? So the flow is zero, the capacity is zero. All right. So that's, that's like a more mathematical way to write what is a flow. Like what is ST flow? Okay. Question about this? Good. And now I will have one terminology as well. I just say that an edge is saturated if the flow saturates the capacity of, a, of that edge. Like if you cannot send more flow through this edge, then the edge is saturated. Otherwise, I said that that edge is unsaturated. And you see, the value of the flow is just nothing but the flow, the total flow go out of S. That's, that's what we, like this is the thing that we want to maximize. The, I call it the, the, to, the value of the flow is total flow going, going out of S. And you see, this must be exactly the same as the total flow going into T. Because for every other node, you have flow conservation. When you go, you go out of S, it cannot just stop at any node except at T. So the flow out of S must be the same as flow into T. And yeah, the goal is like you have a graph, you want to find this flow with maximum value. So that's the goal. <clears throat> So now, that's the problem. Um, so let's try to see how to solve this problem. Let me try to give some natural way to solve this, but it's not going to be a good algorithm yet. But at least it will motivate us to the good algorithm that use some concept called residual graphs. So one very natural algorithm to solve this Maximum flow problem is just to be greedy, right? So let's try to see how it should be. Um, this is not a good algorithm yet, but let's see how it is. Let's say that I just initialize my flow to be empty flow. It's just zero. And now um, what I'm going to do is just look at the graph. And I want to see if there is any ST path in the graph where all the edges in the, in the path are not saturated yet. So all these edges are not saturated. I can still send some flows, like I can still augment some flow through this, through this path, P. Then if I find such a path, I just set F here to be the maximum flow along this path. Try to send as much as possible possible flow along this path. And then just augment this flow into my, my flow. And if you do that, this, this action will basically saturate some, some edge along the path. And then you kind of make progress because at least now some edge is saturated and you repeat. Okay. So let's see one example. Like, an example can be like this. This is a good example where, where the algorithm would work, right? So I have, it have you just start with zero flow, then just start, find to try to find ST path. So I go like this. Right? This is a path which is not saturated. Then the flow that I should push through this path should be three. Okay, the flow through this path should be three because that's, this is bottleneck. Right. And then once I do this, now I try to find another path that is that are unsaturated. I cannot go through this again because this one is already saturated, but I still go, can go through this one. And then I just find this flow, find this path, send the flow. And the amount of flow it should be like ten, yeah, right? Because that this is a bottleneck. Okay. So, and if I send the flow like this by ten unit here, that's gonna be a max flow. So it's good. 
but you see this algorithm might not be good because this this look at this graph okay when I try to find a path whose edges are all unsaturated, I might be stupid and find this path. Right? If I find this path, I send the flow by one, one, one. And now, once I do this, I cannot continue. Right? Because any path from S to T must use some saturated edge. There is no path which is unsaturated anymore. So not so good. Um, so I can make a like, bad choice. Um, do you have some suggestion? Like what should be the good choice of a flow of, of path from S to T? Like, this is a bad, bad, bad path. Is that like, a good choice of path to choose? Maybe if you choose like the shorter path that just from like S to the top or text T. And yeah, to the like, T. yeah, if you choose the shortest path, for example, in this example, it would work because if you choose shortest path, like you would, you, the shortest path in this graph is of length two, so you would go like this and then go like this and then you get a maximum flow. However, um, you see like, there is a bad example when we choose the shortest path as well. The graph can look like this. And now you see that the shortest path just go like this. Right? You put one, one, one here. And now, um, but you see that this is not, and now you cannot choose another path because any other path will like, be blocked by this path. Although you know that the, the max flow in this graph is two because you can go this way. This way. Okay. So shortest path is not like always the best. So and actually it's not quite clear what is how do you choose the path um, so that it's not gonna be blocking the next path. So now the idea this motivates the, our next idea, which is, okay, what if we, what if we try to cancel what we have done before? Okay. So, okay, we, we want to cancel the previous bad path, bad flow. So what if I have this path? I chose it, I chose it in the past, it's a bad one, but what if I try to do something like this? Um, try to send flow, you see? And, okay, some flow is going through this thing. I could just try to cancel what I have done by just going uh, like against it and then go this way. And the flow that go against each other, you can think of it as like something it cancel out and the resulting flow is now max flow. Next example, like this example, um, you see, you have the flow that go in this direction, which means that you can try to cancel it in the opposite direction. And so the path that you can choose next is like, just go this, like this. And you can so what the flow that go against each other. And what you get is this. Okay, question. Um, how do you know like what is bad? Like Yeah, so we will we would we don't know which one is bad, but um, so basically I'm gonna say that I will just try to try to find path that um, if I can find a path that cancel all flow and still can reach T, then, then that's fine. I make progress. Okay. So this is just an intuition uh, slide, but the goal is that you say like, what we want to do is to formalize when we can cancel the flow that we previously made. 
And that concept will use something called residual graph. Question. So in the residual graph, there is a graph going to find the front line. Yeah, uh, we're gonna look, we, I'm gonna define this now. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's try to formalize when we can cancel the flow. So let's say that we have some old flow that we have made, that we have created, call it F, right? So F is just a flow in G. I will define, so F will define something called residual graph, GF. Okay. GF is a graph with, with, a, with the same set of, of, of node, but it has different capacity. I call this capacity, residual capacity. So the residual capacity of each edge, UV, is just the capacity of original edge minus the amount of flow that you have used it. Okay. And you think of this residual capacity as the amount of additional flow that you could, that could be sent through this edge without violating the capacity constraint. Okay, so if you look at this picture, maybe focus on this edge. It's the edge that go from S to maybe call this node V. So the residual capacity from S to V is now 15 because it has 20, you have used five units. But you see, I have this thing too, like an edge from V to U, uh, to, from V to S, um, because now I could have sent flow in this direction by at most five unit without violating the, the capacity constraint. <laughs> so you have this reverse edge, yeah. because you now can push five unit of flow in this reverse direction if needed. And you see that it, it just fit this, the, this definition. Why? Because you see the capacity, the residual capacity from B to S is just the capacity minus the flow. The capacity used to be zero, but what is the amount of flow from B to S? It's minus five from B to S because you send from S to B five, so the V from B to S is minus five. So that, this is like zero minus minus five, which is five. But you, you, can, you can get an intuitive meaning from, from this, really, just that like you have sent five, so you can cancel this, you can cancel the flow up to five unit in, in the opposite direction. And you just put five unit here. Okay. And, um, when you write down the, the residual graph, I will always omit an edge with zero residual capacity just because you cannot send flow through zero capacity anyway. So for example, if, if I have sent this flow, right, then the residual graph will just look like I just flip direction of this edge. Flip it, flip it, flip it forget the guy with zero capacity. And you see that just trying, just by looking at the path in the residual graph, you get some kind of this, a path like this. And this is exactly the path that we can use and it might cancel some old flow, but we, we, it's valid to use it. And that lead us to like one of the first MacFlow algorithm by Ford Ferguson uh, from 60 years ago. This is nothing but to be greedy, but do it in the residual graph. So you recall this greedy algorithm, right? Keep finding a path in the graph and send the flow along the path. Now just do the same thing, but do it in the res residual graph. So I just keep, keep finding a path. If it exists in the residual graph, this path will have non-zero residual capacity because I, 
I don't have an edge with zero residual capacity. So find a path with non-zero residual capacity in this one. Try to send flow along this path in, in the residual graph and augment that flow. So that's the algorithm. So let's see how it works in action. Well, in the beginning, the flow is empty. So residual graph and uh, the current graph are the same. Now you've tried to find a path in residual graph. And you get that 5 is the bottleneck. So you send 5 units of flow along this path. Send it. Once you send the flow, you need to update the, the residual graph. Okay. So now the residual graph is updated. And that finished the first round. Then you just find another path in the residual graph, maybe like this. Now this is a bottleneck. So you send 15 units of flow and update the residual graph and just repeat. Okay. Keep repeating. Do it again, again. And observe that this is for example, here, you try to find this path. And this is when you, you, you use the, the reverse edge, because you have sent the flow in this way, right? But now you want to, this is, if you want to augment the path like this, this is where you need to cancel flow, right? So now the flow, the flow of five units. Uh, oh, what? The flow of five units there, here, yeah, is now undone. Okay. So this is like the power of uh, residual graph. It allows you to not care, even if you make a bad choice in previous iteration, you can cancel it. Okay. And now, this is at this point, there is no path from S to T in the residual graph, right? Um, at least from this example, uh, I want to argue that at least from this example, the flow must be maximum. Like you cannot augment more, more flow. Like you cannot increase the value of the flow. Do you see like a, at least some argument, why is it the case in this example? How come you cannot augment any more flow? You already use like the maximum of all edges that going from S. Yeah, exactly. If you look at these edges going out of S, right? These already are saturated, all of them. There's no way you can like send more flow. Otherwise, um, the capacity would be violated. So you can think like you have some cut like this. This cut, when the flow going, like the edges going out of this cut are all saturated, that is a certificate that your flow is already maximum. Okay. So this is just one example, but you will see soon that um, this is this will be a general general argument why Ford Ferguson will give you maximum flow. Yeah. Okay, but before we go to the analysis um, question about the algorithm, how it works, is it clear? Okay, so I will now try to analyze this algorithm. Okay. Um, so first of all, we want to say that, OK, let's forget about that, that it returned you a maximum flow. At least, we want to argue that it, is, it, it returned you a feasible flow. Yeah. Um, it's a valid flow. So and what, what I want to argue is that, actually, at any point of time, the flow that we maintain are always feasible. And initially, the flow is 0. So trivially is feasible. And now, let's try to argue that 
every time that we update the flow by F prime, um, given that the old flow was feasible, the new flow must be feasible as well. And there is just two things to, to prove, right? Flow conservation and, and capacity constraint. So the first one, flow cons conservation, we want to say that um, in and out flow at every node, which is not source and sync, are the same. And that is easy to see because, OK, F new is just F O plus F prime. Now the old flow is like a half flow conservation by induction. How about F prime? Right. F prime will have flow conservation as well. And the reason is that how F prime look like? F prime looks like some path, some ST path. This is how F prime look like. And if you look at, and, and maybe it, it sends flow like a 10 unit along this path. And for any node which is not S and T, the inflow and outflow must be the same. It's just going in in one place and going out in one place with the same capacity, same where your flow. So inflow and outflow of F prime are the same. So because flow conservation is true for both F O and F prime, you're done. You get that F new must have flow conservation. So that's simple. How about capacity constraint? Uh, OK. So, so you have that the flow on F new. Oh, this should be from U to E. Sorry. From U, from U to B. The flow from U to B is of F new is just the amount of flow of, of F O and F prime, right? But now F prime, like it respects the residual capacity, meaning that the amount of F of flow on, on F prime is at most capacity minus F F O. So now, when you add this thing up, it's at most a capacity. Okay, there's another question. So this is just um, the, like a calculation, but you should get an intu intuitive uh, um, feeling just from the fact that you send flow through the residual graph, and you respect the residual capacity. So j just from like the definition how we define residual graph, you will get the flow, the flow re respect capacity at all time. Okay. But OK, so this is easy to see that the flow is always feasible. And now we, what we want to show is at the end, we get maximum flow now. And to, to, to show that, we need a new concept, which is ST cut. So which is similar to like a cut that we have seen before, but let me define what is ST cut. So I said that, let's say A and B is a partition of vertices in the graph like this. This is A and B. A and B is a ST cut if S is on the A side and B is on the B side. And A and B partition the vertices. Okay. So that's, that's what we call ST cut. It's simple. And we will say that the capacity of this cut, the total capacity of a cut AB, is just the sum of the capacity of edges from A to B. And, I, and importantly, I don't count the capacity of edges from B to A. So if you have this cut, then I count capacity of every one from A to B. For the edge that go in this direction, we don't count the capacity. That's the capacity of a cut. And now, um, how does it? How does ST cut have anything to say about ST flow? Um, so, I want to say that the like 
ST card, the value of ST card is always the upper bound of ST flow. Okay. So if you have uh, a flow F, which is ST flow, might not be maximum any ST flow. And if you say that I have A and B, which is any ST cut, okay, then let's forget about this for a moment. Just look at this lemma uh, right away. Um, we can you, can, you should be able to say that the value of flow is at most the value of uh, of the cut. And the reason is like this. So if you have a graph, right, this is S and this is T. Okay. And now let's look at any cut AB. There is some capacity of the cut. Uh, there is some edges on the opposite direction, but we don't care. We don't count this thing. Okay. This we we don't we don't count the capacity on the opposite side. So you know that whenever you want to send flow from S to T, um, the flow must go through the cut edges in the from A to B direction. The flow must go through this thing. Okay. It might it might go in this direction and go here and then go this way. But in any case, for each unit of flow that you successfully send from S to T, it must consume the capacity of a cut. Okay. From, from from in this in the A to B direction. So, um, so you then you just have that the cut must be the like the capacity of a cut is always the bottleneck of of the value of the flow. So this is one like very intuitive uh, statement to to see, but we can also show it um, in the formal way as well. And um, to do it formally, I have one exercise for you um, to verify this statement. That is, if you have a flow, let's say like. Maybe the flow looks like this. And then it looks like this. Okay. So there's like a, a flow from S to T of two unit. Okay. And now um, I'm going to say that the total value of flow actually is going to be exactly the total flow that you go out of a cut that you send out of a cut from A to B minus the total flow that you send from B to A. So for example, in this, in this uh, example, you have that the total flow that you send from A to B is like this one, this one, this one. So this is three. This is summing over all flow from edges from summing over all edges from A to B. This is three in this case. And minus the total flow that you send from B to A, in this case is one, because you use this guy once. So, and the value of the flow in this case is two exactly. Okay. So this is just the statement that you get, and you can at least see from this example that is true. Um, so the total value of flow is just the flow out of a cut minus the flow into the cut. I encourage you to try to, to prove it. I even put the how to prove it here, but it's just some math that you can verify. But given this thing, right, 
given that you have this equality, you can also say that this thing is at least zero. This thing is at least the capacity of a cut. So you get that, that by the value of the flow is at least the capacity of the cut. So what, you, what I want you to have right now is that you should have an intuitive understanding that this should be true. And uh, why this is true, you should have intuitive feeling too, but you can try to prove it formally at home. Okay. All right. So now we, we have some some relationship between flow and cut. Right? Cut is the bottleneck of a flow always. Okay. Question about this? So the second term is always non-negative because by definition the flow cannot be negative or something? Uh, so I mean the flow on the the flow on the edges of the graph will not be negative. Mm. Yeah. Right, right. The flow that on the opposite direction of the edge can be negative. But here I sum over all edges in the graph. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now comes with this um, understanding. Now we kind of reach the highlight of of this part of this lecture, which is. The max flow mean cut theorem is a very famous uh, theorem. And let's see what it says. Um, so we're going to prove that three statements here are equivalent. The first statement says that um, the, the value of the flow match the value of some cut. And we, the second statement said that, OK, if this is the case, if the value of the flow match the value of some cut, the flow must be maximum. The third statement says that, OK, when the, max, then when the flow is maximum, then there is no path from S to T in, in residual graph. OK. Suppose that these are equivalent and true. Do you see why Ford Bogerson uh, must be must return you a maximum flow? Why is that? Yeah. Because of number two and number three, four figures and like relies on number three, like the loop terminates when number three is false. So exactly. Ford Bogerson just return you a flow just when there is no part from S to T in the residual graph. That's why the flow must be maximum. Okay. So we need to prove that they are all the same here. So let's, let's prove it. Um, what I'm going to show is like a 1 implies 2, 3 implies 3, and 3 implies 1. So why 1 implies 2? That's simple, because you know that, OK, uh, if you have a ST cut B, any flow like cannot exceed, the value of that flow cannot exceed this cut, any flow. But if, the, if your flow match this bottleneck, it must be the, the maximum guy. OK. That's simple. How about from 2 to 3? What I'm going to prove is I'm going to prove the contrapositive. That is, suppose that, suppose not 3 implies not 2. So suppose there is a actually ST path in the residual graph. It's a ST path which is which have non-zero residual capacity. Then this is what Ford Focus exactly do, right? Just find that path. Ford Focus is gonna find some path and increase the value of the, your flow. Means that the flow was not maximum because the flow, the flow value can be increased. Okay, so now need to prove from three to one. So 
That's, this is the most interesting thing. Okay, so suppose now that there is no path from S to T in the residual graph. It means what? Means that suppose that I, I run like a depth first search or something from S. You will you will not reach T. You got got stuck at some at some set of nodes. So let A here be the set of nodes reachable from S, and A will not contain T. Is T is going to be on the other side? Okay. So you get A and B. A B now is a ST cut because S on one side, T on the other side. A B is ST cut. Okay. Now, let's try to consider uh, like the flow value on, on the edges between A and B. So you have that in the residual graph, every edges between A and B can only point in this direction. Right? Otherwise, there must be an edge in this way, and like you can reach some guy here in the residual graph. So in the residual graph, all edges is in this direction, from B to A. You cannot have, you cannot have this thing in in the residual graph. But in the original graph, you can still have it, right? You can still have an edge from 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 A to B. I just have that in the residual graph. Every every guy go this way. So now, let's consider this. Let's look at an edge from A to B in the original graph. So let's say that there is an edge from A to B here in the original graph. Then you have that the flow value on A to B must be, must be full. This edge must be saturated. Why is that? Saturated, you would have like a residual, so the path would uh, yeah in the, the residual. Path. Yeah. If it is not saturated, then this direction of edge will still appear in the residual graph. So you know that okay, this this guy must be like must look like this in the residual graph. So the flow must be full. In the same way. Look at the edge in original graph from B to A. The flow must be empty. Like this, this edge from B to A. The flow here must be empty. The flow B to A must be empty because if you actually have sent some flow in this direction through this edge, you're gonna create like a, the opposite edge in there. In the other direction, so that's that's not that's not uh, that can happen. Okay. So what do you, what do we get from now? We get that if you look at the cut st cut here, for every edge that go from b to a, from a to b, you saturate them all. You saturate the uh, every edge from a to b. And you don't even send anything back from B to A. Which means what? If you, the value of the flow, you have that, this is like the total flow that you send from A to B minus the total flow that you send back from B to A. This thing is zero, and this thing is just equals to the total capacity. Right? So this is, this is some, uh, Edges from A to B. Oh, what, what? From A to B. This equals to the capacity, and this is zero. So you have that the value of your flow actually match the cut size, the, the capacity of the cut. So that completes. Um, the proof. Okay. 
So yeah, now now you have that the fault focus and actually is it, it return you maximum flow. <laughs> and you see this this is not nice, like not only nice in the sense that you, you prove that fault focus and return you maximum flow. It's actually very nice in the sense that it it tells you a very general statement about structure of a graph. Given any graph and any node ST, you now have that the value of max minimum cut is the same as the value of maximum flow. Right? You know, we know before that um, any cut is the bottleneck of flow. This direction is true. But we just show that, okay, there, are, there is always excess some flow that match the value of some cut. So min cut is the same as max flow. The, the value are the same in any graph for any ST. So that's like a very generic statement that is very nice. Okay, so yeah. So now we see that, okay, we, we, we just saw how to f find a maximum flow using Ford Ferguson. Let me ask you one thing quick. Suppose that I give you a maximum flow, how do you compute a minimum cut? Is that, how do you, how do you find minimum ST cut? Anyone? The hint is, the hint is here. Okay. Look, look at the low price. Say it again. Low price. Sorry, I don't quite hear you. Look at the residual graph and then do what? Try to find a path and see where you can go further. Yeah, yeah. Like, just look at the residual graph and exactly try to find a set of nodes that is reachable from S, right? Just get A and B here. And we, we just show that this is, a, this is a cut such that the value of this cut match some value of flow. So it means that this cut must be a minimum cut because all cuts have size at least the value of flow, but this is a cut that with value match the value of the flow. So this is the minimum cut. Okay. So just look at the residual graph, return S A and B, where A is just a set of reachable nodes from, from S. So that's nice. By the way, it's not clear how to compute max flow from min cut. It's clear how to compute min cut from max flow, not, over, not, another, not another way around. I don't know such reduction. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about running time of Ford Ferguson. Okay, so let's try to analyze it. So at least if the capacity are all integer, we have that the number of iteration is at most the value of the flow because in each time you increase the value of flow by, by one at least. And on each iteration, you just do the first search. Takes linear time. And then update the flow that takes linear time at most too. So the total time is just m times the value of the flow. So that's not too bad. At least if all edges have capacity one, then you know that the value of the flow cannot exceed m, the number of edges, because you cannot just use more than, more than M, like, the, the value of the total, like, each flow consumes some capacity of some edge, so you cannot exceed M when the capacity are all one. But in general, this value of flow can be, can be huge. This can be really bad, right? Because let's look at this graph with just four nodes. And B here is some, some big number. And now, like, um, Ford Focus and might do something like 
augment flow in this way. Now this is minus one, minus one, and this the edge going in this way. Then it's just go this way. So you see, like Ford Ferguson can just keep augmenting along this thing and increase the flow by, by one at each iteration. Just spend B, B iteration, although the graph is of size four. So that's very bad. And even worse, like there is an example where the Ford Ferguson, Ford Ferguson might not even stop. If the capacity are not integer, so I put the, the example at the end of this slide, I'm not sure if I have time to talk about it. But anyway, that's the running time of Ford Ferguson. It's, it's fast if, if value of flow is small and uh, the capacity is integer, but otherwise it's, it's not even polynomial time in the size and graph. So what we want to do next is make flow algorithm that really run in polynomial time. So my plan is to define something called blocking flow. This is not Mac flow, um, but then we're gonna look at the algorithm by unit that actually run in polynomial, polynomial time. And the way to do it is like to augment the flow, not through just one path, but through this thing, blocking flow. So we don't just augment uh, through one path at each time. That's the plan. So let's see what is blocking flows. Okay. So recall that edges are saturated if if the if the flow match the capacity. So the definition of blocking flow is this. We say that flow is a blocking flow if for every path from S to T in G, it must contain a saturated edges with respect to F. With respect. For example, um, this this is a blocking flow, right? Um, because any path from S to T now need to go through some saturated edge that is not back flow. So do you know how to compute blocking flow? Like any ideas how to compute blocking, blocking flow? The greedy uh, from like the first, the very first greedy one, just compute some blocking flow. Yeah, exactly. Greedy is exactly the thing that try to compute a blocking flow, right? Well, like just try to look at greedy again, right? Just keep finding a path in the graph, in a, the original graph, such that edges are not saturated then augment along that path and saturate some edge. And repeat until I cannot do it and return the flow. Means that at the end of the algorithm, I claim that F must be a blocking flow because just by construction, we stop whenever every path S to T, from S to T contains some saturated edge. That's when we stop. So that's, that's blocking flow. Like we get a blocking flow just from greedy. And the running time is polynomial, right? Because um, in each iteration, just to DFS, that's linear M. And I claim that there can be at most, uh, at most M iteration as well. And the reason is this, because when you try to find this path, you can just look at unsaturated edge only. The saturated one, you don't, you, you, you don't want to use it. So you, could, you only keep unsaturated edge. And for each iteration, you will saturate one edge at least. 
So in each iteration, iteration, you delete some, like you remove some edge from your consideration. There are at most m edges, so at most m iterations. Okay. So blocking flow can be computed in polynomial time. And uh, actually in your homework, uh, you, you will see how to compute faster. You can do it in mn time, actually. And if the graph is unit capacity, you can do it in even linear time. But anyway, um, right now we just care about poly polynomial time algorithm. And now, given, now I can define Dini's algorithm for max flow. Okay. So if I want to summarize this in one sentence. Dini's algorithm try to augment the flow using blocking flow on some special subgraph. So let's see how it do how it does. You first initialize the flow to be zero flow. Then Look at the residual yeah. graph. And now comes the very important thing. <coughs> I look at G prime. Okay. G prime is the, the graph, which is a subgraph of the residual graph that contains all edges, contains all edges in ST shortest path in the in the residual graph. And by shortest path here, I mean it's unweighted shortest path. So capacity doesn't play any role here. Just count the number of edges. If if there is some path with smaller smallest number of edges from S to T, include that path into G prime. Another way to think about it is like, do breakfast search uh, in, in, in the residual graph, and then, and then like on each layer, like, like uh, do breakfast search, breakfast search until you, you kind of reach T. Any, any path, any path that can, you can go through this. Okay, sorry. Just, just think like this, yeah. Any, looking at any shortest path in residual graph, add that path into, into G prime. So that's G prime. And what I do next is just to send, find blocking flow in G prime. <coughs> This is a subgraph or, or residual graph. Once I find blocking flow in G prime, I just augment that flow. And then I continue. So just for comparison for now, um, for focus and just augment along one path, but we need augment along blocking flow in G prime. So let's see, let's see example. So, you have graph in the beginning. The flow is is empty. Okay. So the graph and the residual graph are the same. Then I look at G prime, which is um, these edges. Like the distance from S to T in 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 residual graph right now is three. So there are two parts like this. These edges are not in like are not in the shortest path. So only the bold edges are, are in G prime. And what you do, you compute blocking flow in G prime. So I find blocking flow, that's F prime. Augment it. And that finished the first iteration. And then look at this GF, and then look at G prime, which is now like 
you see the distance from S to T actually increase from three to four. And you just look at all, all the edges in the shortest path. That these are the bow edges. Then find a blocking flow on the bow edges. Augment it. Okay. And once you augment this, you once there is no like there is no path from S to T anymore because you see uh, all edges are, only go out of T. So that's when you finish. So is the algorithm clear? Not the analysis, but the statement, how it works. Would this also work if you just use GF instead of G prime? I think so, except that you can find blocking flow in G prime faster. Right, okay, so it's just faster, it's not yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. So the augmenting flow is now the max flow, but I think in some cases it might be the max flow. Right? Only in some case, yes. Yeah. But you see, like here we compute uh, a blocking flow in G prime, not even in G F. So um, it might not even like if even if you compute max flow in G in G prime. It might not give you max flow in in the whole graph, yeah. but in some special cases. So. In some special cases, it will be fine. Okay. So yeah, um, G prime is always a deck. That's why, like, I want to do, I want to compute blocking flow in G prime, okay. and. Um, like the greedy algorithm will work in even if the graph is not a DAG, but in your homework, um, you get a faster algorithm for computing com for computing blocking flow when the graph is a DAG. That's why I want to look at G prime. Anyway, um, that's the algorithm. Let's try to analyze it, right? Okay. So we we know that when the algorithm finished. It will return you blocking. It will return you maximum flow by the same reasoning because you finish only when there is no path from S to T in the in the residual graph. So you you get maximum flow. That's fine. All we need to do now is just analyze the time. And the key lemma is this. I claim that. So you saw before that, like here, the the distance from S to T increased from three to four after one iteration to four, and I claim that this will happen always. That is, the distance from S to T will increase by at least one. Okay. It's not that clear, but let, let's prove this later. Suppose that this is true. Uh, how many iterations of, of Linux algorithm can there be? N minus one. N minus one. Yeah, exactly. Because if it is more than N minus one, then the distance is at least N, but it must just mean that there is just no path from S to T. Okay. So that can be at most n minus one iteration. And it just means now that the running time is to do n minus one iteration of computing blocking flow, like plus the linear time you would do to like update the flow and residual graph. So that's is polynomial time, right? Because blocking flow, you can do it in poly polynomial time. I show you how to do this in m square time. You actually can do it in mn time. So the running time is mn square. So yeah, we get pol polynomial time, blocking, 
block uh, Maxwell algorithm. And now uh, just need to prove this key lemma. Okay. Let's see why why it is the case. So what I want you to have in mind is this picture. Okay. So let's see what I mean by this. I will, I will define the layer J, LJ, to be all nodes such that, such that the distance in the residual graph from S to that node V is J. So S is like a L0, and then you, you have L1 in the next layer, L2 in the next layer. And let's say that D here is the distance from S to T in, in the residual graph. Okay. Now you see that now you you like G prime has like a nice looking structure. Because when you draw this in layer, right? Then G prime kind of just co just collect only edges in the shortest part from S to T. It means that it will collect only edges that go forward from 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 in this layer graph. Because if for any edge that doesn't go forward, it cannot be in the shortest path, right? Edges that keep like. You you know that like there is some path that takes that go forward only and and takes this step from S to T. So any edge that actually stay in the same layer or go backward, that edge like the path that goes through these bad edges cannot be in the shortest path. Make sense? So G prime only collect all the forward edges. Okay. So that's G prime. Like G prime only have forward edges. It's a green thing here that I drew. And F prime is the blocking flow in G prime. Just some some flow inside the green graph. That is a that is a blocking flow. Now comes the important claim. So everything clear is is it clear about this picture? Um, so G prime only have forward edges. And now what we do is this, right? Um, I want to claim that if you look at any path P inside the graph after you augment F prime. After you augment F prime, if that path go from S to T, I claim that the length must be strictly more than D. If that is the case, then uh, then we are done, right? Because it means that the distance from S to T after augmentation is now strictly more than D. It increases. So why why is this is true? Okay, so this is like the, the integrate proof. So if you look at the graph here, yeah, the residual graph after I augment f prime, let's see how it looks like. I might introduce some new edges into this residual graph because I augment along green edges. So I might introduce some new edges that go backward. Okay. So the first thing to note is that if you look at this residual graph after augmentation, there's no new forward edges. I only add new backward edges. Okay. Next. 
Now, if I ask you, if you look at this path, P, can it be the case? So this is the most important step. Okay? Can it be the case that the path P in this new graph only contains forward edges only? And I claim that that cannot be the case. Why? Because, because f prime is the flow that is blocking in g prime. So if there is some, if there if there is a path that uses only green edges with non-zero residual capacity that go from from s to to t, right? It means that f prime is not a blocking flow in g prime. Make sense? Because if if the, if the part P contain like if the part P after augmentation contains only like forward edges here, right? Uh, it means that this part, the part P. Let's let's let me draw some path. Suppose that there is no this no edge here, yeah. and there is some part here, yeah. which is uh like is a path in this is a part P after augmentation. Okay. So it means that um this path is not like every edge in this path is not saturated by f prime because this all of every edge in this path have have non zero residual capacity so this this is not saturated but by definition of f prime it implies that any path in the green graph must contain some saturated edge. So such this, like you cannot just find a path that use only green edges like this. Okay. But now if we know that it, it just cannot be the case that the path from S to T contains only forward edges, it means that it must contain some, some edge that Go backward, or say it in the same, in the same layer. But if whenever you use backward edges or like um, non-forward edges, your distance will always be at least like strictly more than d. So you have that length of, of p is strictly more than d, and you are done. You have that the distance now strictly increased. Okay. Good. So, so this is like a, maybe the most tricky thing, but I hope you got it. All right. Let me wrap up quickly. Um, so one nice thing about this, like Dini's algorithm and Ford Ferguson, is that okay, it produces max flow regardless. Um, if it returns some flow, it will compute max flow. If the graph has capacity, integral capacity, actually it will compute integral value max flow too. Right? There's no place where we just try to compute fractional value flow instead. Like every edge will have integral value uh, of flow on, on that. So that's the nice property that we will use later too. And yeah, um, this is uh, both of this is like a developed uh, like fifty years ago, but uh, still very active. And like just like last last semester, um, people have finally find a almost linear time algorithm. It takes like m to the one plus zero one 
in time uh, when and you have log w here when w is like the the upper bound on the capacity when the capacity is integer so that's that's cool uh, before this work I, the state of the, of the art used to be my work <laughs> with other people um, like I, I get this kind of running time so I don't pay this thing I just pay polylog so it's still a bit faster when m is bigger than this bigger than into the 1.5 and uh, if you don't want any dependency on w the fastest running time is still m okay. yeah but still a lot of nice question about max flow is still going on and um, anyway next class we're gonna see that now you know how to solve max flow then there's gonna be like 10 other applications you can solve use, using max flow so let's let's see uh, that in next class